Hello, I'm Mokar Rizvi, and this is Scope. Now, the Royal Commission, or a Royal Commission, I should say, is looking into the Christchurch terrorist attacks that took place not too long ago um, in New Zealand. Now, it's been said that this attack came as a surprise, especially to those within uh, the intelligence community and, of course, the greater New Zealand society as well. But that uh, should be a surprise to many in and of itself because it seems that all the red flags seemingly were ignored and or over looked due to issues of possibly racism, Islamophobia, etc., that existed uh, within the structures of law enforcement and the intelligence community as well. That's according to, uh, and I'm paraphrasing of course, a report that's been released by the Federation of Islamic Associations of New Zealand, um, which has then released this submission for this Royal Commission of Inquiry into that terror, terrorist attack at those Christchurch mosques. Um, we're going to discuss that now further with the chairperson of the Federation of Islamic Associations of New Zealand. Uh, Mr. Abdul Razak, who is joining us this evening from Wellington. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, Abdul Razak. We appreciate your time this evening. Uh, why, firstly, tell us about your involvement, about your organization's involvement with the Royal Commission of Inquiry. Uh, what are your thoughts about it and, and how it's moving forward at this time? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. rahman rahim The Federation of Islamic Associations of New Zealand is the national umbrella body uh, of the seven local associations uh, around, covering all of New Zealand. Uh, we, there are approximately 60,000 Muslims in New Zealand. We don't claim to speak for all of them, uh, but uh, there is a, this is the oldest national organization and the only nat uh, Islamic national organization we've been going for. I think this is our 41st year. Um, the Federation being um, a pivotal uh, organization for the Muslims, uh, we were requested to make a submission to the Royal Commission. Uh, let me preamble by saying that um, when this attack happened, we were, the Federation was one of the, in fact, the only organization from the Muslim side requested by the New Zealand government through the New Zealand police to go uh, into the field as the response team. Hmm. So we had an emergency response team, uh, of course, not for this, but other who were there in the ground in the first uh, four hours helping from everything from liaison with the victims, with the police, all the uh, international and national guests who were coming. Uh, and later on, of course, with the janazah and the burial hmm. and the coordination of the government and, and the local and the national and the international level. Right. Um, so after that, we put together a, a document of what we did. And part of our uh, approach was to uh, request the government for a royal commission as opposed to just a commission of inquiry. Uh, our Prime Minister was very kind enough to accept and uh, uh, our request, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a Royal Commission. We won't say just because of us. I'm sure that you know that we have one of the most amazing Prime Ministers in the world who is very, very, very uh, tuned to the uh, uh, all the uh, communities in New Zealand, not just the Muslim. And it was a case where this uh, tragedy uh, touched all of New Zealand, uh, doesn't matter where they were, what nationality, I mean, what right. uh, uh, religion they were and like. So okay, when it so came to the Royal if, Commission... If I may come in, I, I, I apologize for interrupting you, but uh, I think we've gotten a good picture of, of the involvement, but I just, I just wanted to ask, you know, if I may delve directly into the report, because I think I want to get to the crux of the, the matter as well. Um, you know, there, there is significant criticism within the report as, as laid out by your organization to the Royal Commission. Um, why were a lot of these red flags uh, overlooked and or ignored? I mean, it do, uh, the report does say that I believe it was six months before the attack or nine months, it may have been, uh, that there was then an understanding that the far right was uh, becoming a problem, but yet um, the intel community and others weren't able to prevent this altogether. Why do you think that is? Basically, we found there were two levels. The first level was the New Zealand intelligence community, particularly the security intelligence service. They were looking in the wrong direction. They were only fo focused on the Muslims, and we gave evidence in there, and they were exclusion at the exclusion of everybody else. Uh, they totally disregarded the, um, the growth of the uh, right-wing extremism all over the world. Um, from the time of Brevix in, uh, in Norway in 2011, there were some 44 uh, such right-wing ex major attacks all over the world. In 2018, 100% of all that extremist uh, murders in the states were by committed by the right-wing extremists. All that threatscape was completely ignored, in, and they were just focusing on the Muslims. And we say that was actually uh, what 
was one of the reasons why they never caught the, um, uh, this perpetrator, this terrorist. On the other side, we had the New Zealand police who weren't following their own uh, gun licensing procedures. Uh, the gun licensing procedures for your readers in New Zealand, it's quite, it says basically you have to have uh, somebody in your family who will vouch save you, uh, like your parents or somebody who's known you within the family, and uh, also somebody else who's known you for a while. Instead, uh, this person, this terrorist, and we call him a right-wing advoc advocating terrorist, we call him a rat. Hmm. Uh, we will never mention his name. Uh, this rat uh, relied on gaming friends uh, online uh, for his uh, uh, reference. The police accepted that. Yeah. Uh, moreover, the, the police didn't follow through on some of their uh, interviews, which they, they did an interview. Here's a person who came to the country recently who wasn't employed, who didn't have gun collection as a hobby, who hmm. wasn't going hunting, who didn't belong to a gun club. These are the three main reasons. Yet they gave him a gun. Uh, and that resulted in, of course, them getting, him getting a gun and so on and so forth. The reason for this is multifold. We are not blaming any individuals. Hmm. First of all, in the police side, it was a simply a, it was a case where the police themselves, in their annual report, said they deprioritized arms licensing. Now okay. that's alarm bells everywhere. Uh, New Zealand had at that time 99.6 or 99.8 percent approval rate for the fire license, right. no uh, for the arms license. So no wonder. And in terms of the security um, uh, intelligence and also our DPMC, which is the Department of Prime Minister mm. Cabinet, uh, we have what, what's called a national um, uh, New Zealand national intelligence priority. Okay. There, that in itself was not uh, made public and was totally focused on Muslims and nobody else. And so I, I, I wonder that if, 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 if I, mean, I I wonder though, you know, there there has been some concern about what may or may not be released to the public, right? And of course, your organization has has released um, at least some of the reports that I've understood and I've seen in articles online as well as your own website as well about the findings of your own report. But at the end of the day, you know, there's a lot of witness testimonies, etc. There's always, of course, the argument of national security, and I'm sure that's of course a very legitimate argument to a, a certain extent. But do you think that there needs to be greater transparency just overall when it comes to this issue so that, God forbid, there isn't a repeat either towards the Muslim community or any other community in New Zealand or otherwise. Let's distill that very clearly. We're talking about two things here. One is we are talking about the Royal Commission and their approach. And secondly, we're talking about the evidence. Now, until we see the findings, which is coming out on the 8th, uh, we really can't comment on whether the, uh, there's been suppression or not. Uh, or otherwise, let's see the evidence, let's digest it, and then see what else we, we need. If we find that the answers are not there, then, of course, we will ask for more evidence which has been collected. So it's, it, we are jumping the gun. On the other side, all I can say is the Royal Commission was uh, fit for purpose. They were very diligent, extremely transparent. They were very, very, very thorough. We had every opportunity to take part. We asked questions. They engaged with, I had monthly meetings with the Royal Commissioners. Um, all our questions were, uh, well, we were able to ask questions. So mm -hmm. that process was very well. So it's too early to jump the gun whether they, uh, yes, they did say a 30-year ban on on evidence. Well, we don't know, we haven't seen the uh, findings. So let's look at the findings first before we make any comments. We have Perfect. to be very yep. rational about it and yep. not be sort of um, excited about, what, uh, about these uh, uh, statements. No, and that, that's a very good to, to end the conversation on. We sincerely, of course, appreciate your taking your time out of your busy schedule to, to share your expertise and your thoughts with us. Um, speaking to us there from Wellington is Mr. Abdul Razak, um, the chairperson of the Federation of Islamic Associations of New Zealand, speaking about the report that his organization has submitted to the Royal Commission of Inquiry into the terrorist attack on Christchurch mosques. You know, a, a whole bunch of red flags were missed, certainly in the lead up to this terrorist attack. Why were they missed? What kind of uh, racism slash Islamophobia a narrative, media narrative, as well as government narrative fed into that, um, and then have the lessons been learned? Um, yes, there's a lot of credit to be given, certainly, to the, to the New Zealand government, as well as the Prime Minister, on how things have been handled after the fact, but um, how, what kind of preventive measures are now being put in place? Um, there were still reports of Islamophobia even after the attack took place, uh, especially upon Muslim women, etc. Those reports are out there uh, in the public domain for others to view as well. So the concern remains then that has this far right threat been understood properly in New Zealand and beyond, and is it being dealt with properly as well? I'll be back with my next segment after this break. 
Welcome back, viewers. You're still here on Scope with me, Wilkar Rizvi. Now, in this segment, we're going to discuss an issue which has been simmering for a while now, and that is allegations that Frontex, which is the EU's border agency, has been involved in pushing back migrants, especially, uh, of course, when it comes to the Greek waters or waters around Greece. Uh, there have been purported videos even released or, uh, you know, alleged videos about how those pushbacks may very well have occurred. There have been some details that have come out in, in a lot of media reports uh, over the past number of weeks as well about how this may have occurred, about the kinds of waves that were created in order to, to deter migrant boats from entering into EU waters. Um, now all, of this, all of this, of course, goes in the face of what the e European Union's international obligations are to begin with, but even the bloc's own stated moral values and human rights values, certainly. Um, and all of that then has now come to a head where there was a meeting in Brussels and the, e the Frontex director then defended Defended his own agency, saying that in fact no one of his agency or no officials within his agency were actually responsible for any such pushbacks. And he did not, of course, get into great detail, at least to the best of my knowledge, about what the Greeks may or may not have done of their own volition if that did occur in that fashion. Let's discuss all of that a bit further. I'm joined by Dr. Thomas Gamaltoft Hansen, who is a professor at the University of Copenhagen. He's also an honorary professor at Aarhus University. He's joining us today from Copenhagen. Joining us today from Utrecht is Mariana Glatt who is a researcher at Leiden University. She also teaches at the University of London. And finally, we're joined on the line from Madrid by Alfredo Campos, who is a general secretary and head of the legal department at Mundos. Alfredo, Mariana, and Thomas, thank you to all three of you for your time today. Uh, Thomas, let me start with you. Um, do you believe, and obviously this is, you know, these are allegations this time, but do you believe that Frontex would have carried out some sort of pushbacks? Because there has been, to be fair to the agency and the European establishment as a whole, there's been a lot of pressure to, to stop what's been at least deemed a migrant flow into, into the bloc. If we look at the evidence, it, it, it certainly appears as if uh, there might be problems in terms of the operations carried out. I think it's too early to conclude decisively whether the allegations are true. But it speaks into a pattern where there have been repeated incidents in which uh, Frontex and Frontex seconded officers are participating in operations where at least the authorities of some member states uh, have have been reported um, to carry out uh, human rights violations in the context of, of migrant handlings. And, and what we need to remember in this context, of course, that Frontex itself, the EU agency, operates largely through contributions from the different member states. And those are, of course, first and foremost, the host governments in which they operate, so in this case, either Greece or maybe Italy, um, but also contribution from each of the different member states uh, sending police or naval officers, ships, airplanes, technical equipment, etc. So, so it's a fairly mm. complicated machine yeah. also from, from a kind of political and responsibility perspective. And, you know, Mario, it, does, it doesn't help, does it, that obviously uh, the EU countries have not been able to really agree upon this migrant quota scheme, which, which the bigger countries such as Germany and France and others wanted, um, you know, some of the other countries to accept, and they haven't accepted it, um, obviously for various political reasons, because, again, the narrative has always been that there has been this invasion of migrants into the bloc. What are your thoughts about that? Indeed, you're very much right in your, uh, in your observations. The, um, the situation in the Mediterranean is much more complicated than uh, a simple uh, allegation of pushbacks. There are many hands involved. There are many actors at play. That is including including Greece and the reported allegations for pushbacks. In, and above all, as you said, the responsibilities of, of the European Union for not managing the migration situation in a way that would be in accordance with migrants' rights and in accordance with the needs of, uh, of the member states as well. Uh, we see a turn in EU migration policies in the last years towards securitization and, and, and protectionism that does not also allow for uh, legal avenues for refugees or, uh, as you mentioned, the relocation of people from uh, the coastal member states, especially Greece and Italy. There was such an attempt uh, that was greatly voluntary and um, it failed. Only one third of the, uh, of the refugees managed to be resettled in Western Europe. And these attempts have now stopped. And now we see that the new framework for migration that the European Commission has proposed, the new Pact on Migration and Asylum, 
also moves towards uh, a different direction from that of solidarity and, and relocation of, uh, of migrants and responsibility sharing amongst the member states of the European Union. And that also brings Frontex yeah. itself in a situation that uh, very often will be confronted with breaches of fundamental rights. In Greece, in particular, it found itself in a situation where uh, there have been systemic violations reported for years. This is not the first incident. This is not the first time. And also in a time that um, there was a, a legislative change in the country forces that suspended asylum law hmm. uh, for one month, suspended registrations and uh, um, formalized pushbacks uh, in, in formal legislation. So hmm. in this environment, it would be very difficult for the agency to fully comply uh, with fundamental rights and not be found complicit in violations. Uh, Alfredo, what are your thoughts? Because, you know, one of the arguments obviously has been uh, for a while now, and I know at least early on in the migrant crisis, was that this was also a national security threat, right? Because a lot of, uh, at least at the beginning, a lot of people from Syria were the ones who were entering into the bloc, and there was this concern that there may very well be terrorists or alleged terrorists amongst those people. What are your thoughts on that? How does one balance that out with then, obviously, also respecting international law and human rights? Good morning, good morning. I, I cannot listen very well, but I, I'm going to try to to, to to express my own point of view. Okay. Sure. Uh, yes, uh, of course, we have to keep in mind that we have to respect the, the also the, the Geneva Convention because uh, every every migrant that has a welcome this fear prosecution has the right to ask for asylum in, in Europe, and this is. This is uh, one thing that is in, in our roots, so we cannot forget this. And we also have to, to, to keep in mind that we have to respect the Convention of the Sea Law, because uh, in this convention, in, in the Article 98, uh, all the states, every state, uh, every every state in the sea has uh, has, has to, to rescue, has the, the duty of, of rescue that uh, uh, Every person that uh, every ship that is in damage, uh, so we have to, to yeah. not to, to forget these these two important conventions. But uh, this, the problem is this is the, the starting point of all these problems uh, are in uh, in 2015 with the refugee crisis that uh, started Europe started to to receive uh, uh, suppose. Uh, Big, very big flows of uh, migrants and refugees. But uh, mm -hmm. if we consider the figures of other countries, uh, yeah. for example, uh, for for giving a, a, a near example, for example, Turkey, Turkey is hosting uh, a, a very big uh, refugee population. So uh, at this point, uh, in, the, in the beginning, Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, Starts with a policy of uh, um, receiving refugees, but uh, yeah. but uh, uh, later uh, started. Uh, I, I think um, because of the fear of the, the rights of the uh, far right parties in Europe, uh, right. started to, with, yeah. with uh, restrictive policies. Indeed. So uh, all all these things, uh, it only shows the, the failure of. Uh, and that's, and that's a very good point, Alfred, if, if you allow me to come in, because I ask you about that too, Thomas, about, you know, uh, the, the narrative, as, as I've mentioned to, to all the guests so far, uh, about, you know, these, these migrants slash refugees, however you want to term them, because uh, it, it is a fact that a lot of other countries are hosting exponentially more amounts of refugees. Um, we can even talk about the Rohingya in Bangladesh, for example, and, you know, they're doing so, and there may very well be issues there, but they're not being seen as an invasion necessarily. I mean, the, the terminology that is sometimes used by politicians in Europe is quite troubling, isn't it? And do you think that that has played into the uh, not allowing for Frontex to do this sort of thing if it is if it has actually done this, but it's sort of you know fed into that sort of fear? I don't think there's any doubt that for the last five years we've seen a successive harshening of migration control responses pretty much all over Europe, despite the fact that numbers actually have come down almost as drastically as they rose up to. 2015 in terms of numbers of asylum seekers. We're now seeing some increasing on some routes again. Uh, the pandemic plays into this in terms of maybe providing a context for 
further closing down of borders, further stalling discussions on better distribution models, etc. So there's, there's no doubt that, that there are some, especially frontier countries, that feel unduly pressured in this context. And it, it exposes essentially the fragility of the very system being set up. It's a system in which solidarity was always lackluster in terms of redistributing responsibilities, in terms of providing adequate support to the countries facing the, the largest numbers of asylum seekers or refugees. Um, where the sort of paradox in this case is, is that where solidarity uh, hasn't been lacking has been when it came to reinforcing the external borders. And hence the Frontex system built on, on this a very sort of delicate premise of having a, a fairly small chapeau, which consists of EU officials themselves uh, and, and, and EU capacity. But, but the large bulk underneath it is, as I mentioned before, composed of contribution from the different member states. And so the, the great problem uh, of, of an incident like this and, and the repeated accusations that either individual member state authorities or maybe even uh, Frontex deployed contingents uh, are actively contributing to human rights violations or in this case blatant human rights violations such as pushback that violate both refugee law, human rights law yeah. and the law of the set is, is troubling because the entire system is built on the premise that Denmark or Germany or any other country can send contingencies, can actively provide to this on the basis mm. that both the host mm. nation and, of course, the, the Frontex structure ensures respect for uh, fundamental rights and international law. And, and what this yeah. exposes is that, well, yeah. it's not really the picture and, and it's certainly not what seems to be going on in the individual member states. Uh, so, Mariana, what are your thoughts about the politics of all this? Because obviously it's, it's impossible to escape that the reality on the ground that people are nervous about having all these uh, refugees slash migrants coming in um, because at some level, um, you know, the, obviously within the pandemic, especially there's, there's economic pressure upon them anyhow. So they believe that obviously resources will then be very thin and to go around to help. Help any, anybody, but even before that, I mean, there were concerns about national security, etc. What are your thoughts on all that? Uh, this is in a, indeed a very complicated framework. The priorities for uh, the European Union have been uh, set straight in the legislative framework. Um, the European uh, Border and Coast Guard Agency, for example, has been. Uh, receiving continuous uh, enlargements of its mandate and its budget uh, almost every two years since its establishment, since 2004. Uh, with two the 2019, the last um, amendment of its founding regulation, the agency experiencing uh, a broad expansion of its surveillance powers, uh, including returns, deportations, and data management. And for the first time, its budget is counted in billions. So this is the direction that the EU policy is, is taking, responding precisely to these security fears that in the general, more general political context have to do with uh, scapegoating of, of migrants and outsiders uh, in light of an economic crisis that uh, Europe, European countries have still not uh, fully exited uh, in a situation, a context that is exacerbated by the COVID pandemic. So it is uh, a response of these uh, of these concerns uh, mm. that the aid, that the uh, European Union sets securitization priorities, but the alternative would be to participate in a global migration governance uh, mm. in cooperation with other member states and uh, external uh, partners. Um, this is. Migration is not an EU issue. It's definitely not, not an EU problem. It can definitely, uh, we definitely see the potential and we can definitely work together with other uh, countries in terms of, of development, in terms of stability in the region so that we yeah. can address the sources of migration. All right, uh, Fredo, final word before I let all three of you go. Um, what do you think that the coming days will com uh, hold, right, when it comes to Frontex and these allegations? Because the, the, the agency's, uh, you know, director has all, already completely denied these allegations. But uh, do you think that there will be some accountability of some sort, that, that there will be legal, quote-unquote, routes then um, set up for refugees to actually enter the bloc? 
uh, see, I'm not very optimistic uh, uh, on the solution of the problem because the, the, uh, they are going to, I think they are going to continue with the same wrong politics. So uh, now, for example, in, in Spain, in the Canary Islands, we are experiencing the, the coming of, of uh, a lot of uh, migrants from the north of, north of Africa, uh, mainly from Morocco, Algeria, and, and sub-Saharan migrants. And uh, they, they, are, they are replying, they are... Um, the, the, the same model of a um, myriad of uh, yes, uh, to, to, to settle the, the migrants in, in a camp, in big camps, and trying to, to push back them to, to the countries of origin. So I'm not very optimistic. So I think if, uh, um, if, if we only work at the border, we, we are uh, showing that the, the model is a complete failure. It, it's not... Uh, not uh, successful. So we have to, to work, of course, we have to, in, three, in three areas. We have to work at the border, of course, mm -hmm. but we also have to work uh, in the transit area yeah. and, of course, in, in origin. And the solution is not to link development funds to migration agreement, return agreement. So right. that's there are some, some reports that show that this is not a solution. We have to yeah. work in these three dimensions. That's my, my point of view. Okay. Well, we'll leave it there at that. I sincerely appreciate Alfredo, Mariana, and Thomas for their time uh, and, of course, for sharing their expert insight with us. Uh, you know, this, it's, it's not an easy issue, right? Um, it's not as simple as just saying that, um, you know, open the open the floodgates, quote, quote as, as one would imagine. But then at the same time, the argument needs to be made that um, other countries are hosting, as, as, as our guests also alluded to, several more fold refugees and asylum seekers within their borders and are not seeing that necessarily as an invasion or are not pushing back boats necessarily, although, of course, there are human rights issues everywhere in the world. Um, but, you know, the fact that the block uh, of all these countries um, is now OK in some ways, and I'm not, of course, you know, saying every single country or every single person in Europe is OK with this, a majority would not be, but certainly the fact that this is being allowed to have happened, even the, the, these allegations, um, if they are standing, and even if 1% of it is true, that's disturbing, isn't it? Because, again, the numbers that have actually come into Europe in comparison to other countries are, are a lot smaller. And then on top of that, there's, you know, Europe's international obligations vis-a-vis -vis such asylum seekers and migrants who are seeking, for a lot of them at least, safety from persecution. And even for others, even if they are economic migrants, in some ways they do become or are in many, many cases from day one contributing members of those respective societies as well. So, you know, there, there's a lot of human rights issues at play here. National security is certainly an important uh, obligation as well, an important factor to also think about uh, on the European side. I'll be back with my final segment after this break. Welcome back, viewers. You're still here on Scope with me, Wilkar Rizvi. Now, in this segment, we're going to discuss uh, an interesting number of controversies that are, of course, coming out of the U.S., specifically, of course, related to the Trump presidency uh, in its final days now. But the U.S. Justice Department is now investigating a potential, and I should underline that word, potential scheme, in which presidential pardons were allegedly traded for political contributions. Now, on top of this, of course, we can also add the reports coming out today about Donald Trump possibly looking into pardoning his own children, um, i.e., uh, his daughter, as well as his sons, who were involved, of course, uh, during his tenure in the White House and, of course, in many of the activities of himself as a president. Now, within this uh, specific um, allegation of political contributions and that the trade for pardons and that uh, a number of people involved um, set up a secret lobbying scheme of sorts to even seek a pardon for a third party also, uh, there's a lot over of course, over here, uh, Trump has been under fire for a while now. So this is not new, certainly an issue for Donald Trump. He's been under fire for a while now for handing out pardons uh, to former uh, top advisors who were, you know, uh, convicted of federal crimes as well. Is that becoming of a U.S. president? That, of course, remains the question. And I imagine many people's minds in the U.S. and otherwise. Well, let's discuss all of that a bit further. We're not joined by Lauren Brown, who is a political commentator and strategist. She's joining us this morning from Charleston, South Carolina 
Joining us from Syracuse, New York is Dr. Grant Davis Reher, who is the director of the Campbell Public Affairs Institute. He's also a professor of political science at Syracuse University's Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs. Uh, Grant and Lauren, good morning to you both and thank you for joining us. Uh, Lauren, let me start with you. Uh, what do you make of these allegations? Uh, would Donald Trump uh, stoop so low, if I, if I may use that phrase? Well, the short answer is absolutely. Um, across this in, uh, administration, unfortunately, we've seen that the Trump administration is willing to engage in what we would consider um, illegal and inappropriate behavior. Uh, President Trump has flouted what we as citizens consider the norms of the office of the president's multiple times. As you alluded to in your intro, his own daughter was deposed in D.C. for several hours yesterday. Um, and there have been reports put out um, that there's a full bribery scheme afoot at the White House regarding pardons. So sadly, this is not the first instance that we have heard of this type of behavior being associated with Trump, the White House, or the folks um, in his administration, whether that's from his own children to Michael Flynn uh, to Rudy Giuliani, who's also under investigation and potentially facing charges when this administration ends. Grant, I would think that the argument on the part of the president, and you know, he's made no secret of this argument, is that, listen, he has the power to pardon, so why not? Well, I think, first of all, it's important to remember in this particular instance what we don't know. And the report um, uh, that originated from the judge there, released by the judge, uh, says that the investigation uh, uh, has not identified particular uh, targets, and it's not clear whether anyone will be charged uh, from this, and that the investigation so far is of an approach to the White House. There's no information about how those government officials who were contacted reacted yet. And furthermore, uh, the report states that uh, uh, no government official is currently a subject or a target of the investigation. Having said all that, I agree with most of what I just heard uh, from my colleague. Um, uh, th this is nothing new. If this does end up being uh, another instance of uh, bad behavior being exposed on the part of the Trump administration, uh, this isn't anything new. Uh, the president is, has been very brazen about this. Uh, his, you know, his rhetoric is uh, is very direct <clears throat> and hyperbolic about these kinds of things. And so, unfortunately, this is another uh, instance, if it turns out to be the case, another instance in a string of this kind of behavior. Hmm. And, uh, do you think that sometimes um, when it comes to the, the way that Donald Trump is spoken of vis-a-vis, um, -vis, you know, these, these many scandals that he's had, that sometimes uh, we presume things from the get-go um, because he has done things in the past, do you think maybe it's a question of letting, as, as uh, you know, Grant there alluded to as well, letting, letting the process play out? I mean, sometimes I feel like, you know, the, the hyperbole, if, if that's the, the, the appropriate word to use here, you know, sort of gets out of hand sometimes when it comes to Trump and, you know, his actions. Absolutely, because as uh, Dr. Rear mentioned, the document's been heavily redacted, so we kind of don't know what we don't know. And with any uh, investigation, you have to let the facts lead us where they go. However, we have a lot of facts on our side when we look at history in terms of the types of behavior this administration is willing to engage in. I think you also have to consider we are in the middle of a presidential transition, so the career prosecutors do doing this work probably don't want to tip their hand with what information they do have by reaching out to the White House when in just a few weeks, we'll be getting a new administration who likely will not impede the investigation. I cannot see any way in which the White House would cooperate with those looking into a bribery collusion scheme um, happening in uh, right under Trump's nose. Hmm. And then, you know, one wonders, you know, Donald Trump has also spoken about, you know, pardoning himself, right? That, and he said that very openly as well. Um, 
can that actually happen? I know we've spoken about this before as well, but I, I'm just trying to like talk about the ideology of the man overall when it comes to what his view of his presidency and a president's role overall is. I mean, this is then long lasting damage, isn't it? Where if the rest of the public or future presidents look back in history and say, okay, this man was able to, to an extent, get away with, even if we're just talking about present day, where he was able to then, you know, um, pardon a number of his top advisors, that in and of itself has set a president, hasn't it? Well, it can, it can taint the way that a president is remembered, and Bill Clinton did some damage to uh, his legacy by a number of pardons at the last minute including in particular Mark Rich, uh, who kind of made his way through a normal vetting process that was being overwhelmed literally at the 11th hour of Bill Clinton's presidency. Um, but I, I think in this instance with President Trump, there, there's so much on the record here. Um, there, there's so much in, in the four years of his administration that one might look back to that I think this particular thing that we're talking about frankly, as, as important as it might be in other circumstances, is probably not going to rise to the level of the collective historical memory when the presidency of Bill Trump is being, uh, uh, I'm sorry, of, of Donald Trump uh, is, is being considered by historians. Hmm. That's an interesting, Lauren, because, you know, I also, I also wonder, um, and I'm just being devil's advocate here for a moment, that political contributions and lobbyists and all of the above, we know happens, right? And it, ha it happens behind the scenes in every White House, and certainly no one is, is handing money out to any respective president and or his party without strings attached, right? They're expecting something in return, I would imagine, to an extent. So, I mean, is this um, that surprising that a president or would allegedly, again, um, offer a party for example, in return for a huge sum of money. Again, it's abnormal by standards of what we consider that the office holder of the president should do and conduct themselves. But almost by every litmus test, Trump has been a complete aberration to the office of the president. And we've already seen a fair amount of revisionist history come out of the Republican Party, come out of the White House in real time. So going forward, uh, not only may it not be remembered this way, we've already seen people go to great lengths to tell a different story than the one that is. And I don't expect that this particular instance will be any different. There's no doubt the president absolutely has the pardon to power whoever he would like. And unfortunately, this could end up putting the post-Trump presidency and a, quite a bit of legal jeopardy because I don't think we've ever seen a pre-pardon happen. And so there could be many legal challenges to this where any pardons that Trump tries to make of himself, his associates, which also just, if you need to pardon someone ahead of time, it really just begs the question, well, what type of uh, behavior and conduct were going on that even meet the level of needing, of, of needing a presidential pardon before one leaves office. So I think mm. it is fair to say that just the way this is being done, uh, yes, Mark Rich was a questionable pardon. The president does have the right to pardon. But when you're looking at pardoning your own family members, close personal associates, and I say that knowing that there are families across the country, whether they are dealing with uh, cases of inequity in marijuana yeah. laws, uh, who are really counting on the president to bring justice to their families. So it would be great, actually. I would almost want to give the president some credit for using that pardon to help some of these families in the United mm -hmm. States who are desperately seeking justice um, to change their lives instead of impacting the lives of his personal associates and his own children. Okay, so I'll give you the final word before I let both of you go. Um, do you think that there needs to then be, uh, you know, a revisit of presidential powers in the U.S., be it pardon or otherwise, um, because of what we have seen and observed during the pr Trump presidency? There's been an ebb and flow in our history and our sense of whether the president has become too powerful, uh, whether uh, he's not powerful enough. Uh, Congress ebbs and flows in, in, in its powers. Uh, certainly, I think there has been a general concern in the last century that the presidency has become quite powerful. Uh, I don't think, though, to shift topic very quickly at the end, 
I don't think that we as a country will be that well served by prosecuting uh, former President Trump after he's left office. I think that the instinct of Gerald Ford there with Richard Nixon is the right one. Uh, the president's out of office, we move on and we open up a new chapter. I think the longer that we keep looking back at that, the longer we'll be stuck in some pretty bad political places that, um, that, that will just be turning over and over again. So again, I, I think historically this is not the most important thing to be thinking about when considering the ultimate effects and some of the damage that the Trump administration has done to the American political system. Very well. We'll leave the final word, but we sincerely appreciate both Lauren and Grant for their time this morning uh, and, of course, for their expert insight. We're discussing there about the U.S. Justice Department looking into poten potentially looking into, pardon me, a scheme in which presidential pardons were, again, allegedly uh, traded for political contributions. It wouldn't be a huge surprise, would it, to an extent? I mean, it's not like Donald Trump hasn't already handed out pardons. Anyways, would he even need a political contribution, financial or otherwise, really in return for that? He's pardoned top advisors in the past have been um, convicted of federal crimes already. Um, what kind of precedent, though, is this setting? I mean, as, as Grant there said at the end, the debate then becomes, does the president have too much power or too little power? And of course, I imagine that's been a discussion that's happened many times, as Grant also alluded to um, many times in U.S. history. But it, for this specific president and for the days ahead then after his presidency, a lot of questions remain then, right? As Lauren mentioned, will the president himself and those around him be held to account after he's left office. Uh, Grant, they're arguing that shouldn't happen, but then, you know, we don't know what will happen. We don't know what the Biden administration will do. Is it time to just let it all go and try to, you know, start from start a clean slate altogether in the United States? A lot of open questions remain about that issue. I'll leave it there for now. I've been Wakar Vizvi. Thanks for watching.